share share screen, share computer sound. Okay. All right. Well, I think a good thing to do is to continue off on what we were talking about last time, which was modulation. And um, we were, I guess we can refresh some of this stuff just in case it's still a little confusing. Um, the basic idea is that two different key areas in common chord modulation, which is the most uh, straightforward kind of modulation. In common chord modulation, two key areas will have a certain amount of chords in common. And what you could do is you could take the key that you're concerned with and you could just write out the triads for all of the chords in that key. And you can make a little chart such like this, where you basically have the triads of the G major scale. The one chord being G major, the two chord being A minor, three chord being B minor, four chord being C major, five chord being D major, six chord being E minor, and the seven chord being F sharp diminished. So these are all the, like, I guess you could say the primary triads of the G major scale. Um, similarly, if you're trying to figure out um, the similar chords between the keys of G major and D major, you could make a chart for all the chords in D major, and that's what I've done right here. And what you really get by doing something like this, once you line up the chords, is you can really easily see which chords are in common between both keys. Now, with regards to lining up the chords, what I mean by that is the following. Oops, sorry, give me a second. You know, you, the, this is the same exact uh, information as in the previous page that I was just showing you, but they're not lined up. So for instance, I could put this here, and then you'll basically see this information, like so. Um, incidentally, I figured out a feature on OneNote, I'm sorry, on Zoom, that I might as well share with you, just in case you're not familiar with it. Um, if you if you if things are a little small on your end, you can actually um, go to view options and you can view things like 100 or 200 percent or the real size of my screen. And actually, if you engage that mode in, in the view options for Zoom, you'll just basically like it'll probably because I have a gigantic screen, it'll just zoom in on this part of the screen where my cursor is at that moment. So in case things are a little small. I'd, Discover that with my professor the other day, um, just in case um, that's the case for you. But I'll do my job best to make things bigger. Anyway, so what you see ultimately in this chart is our similarities between chords in two different key areas. So. You know what, actually, you know what, I think I'm not actually talking into my webcam right now. I think I'm, talk I think I'm talking into my webcam instead of talking into... Now I'm talking into this microphone, I think. It's a little clearer, probably. Okay. So, in other words, the four chord in D major is the same thing as the one chord in G major. The six chord in D major is the same thing as the three chord in G major. And... You know, I kind of exp you've, if you've read this, it's kind of verbose how you can kind of determine if the chords are actually shared between both keys. You have to make sure the qualities and the root match. And this is why I've lined them up this way. Uh, for instance, A major and A minor don't match, so it's not a common chord you could use between both keys to modulate. Whereas B minor and B minor totally match, so there are common chords between them. They're exactly common, which makes sense, right? Because 
you're really using the core, the same chord in both areas. So of course the chord has to be the same in terms of quality and root. The chord is the same. Um, because ultimately, I guess the name of the game in modulation is in this particular kind of modulation is using one chord to transition between two key areas. So the, the chord exists in both keys. Um, and there is something to be said about um, the circle of fifths. It just happens to be this, that if you're going from um, one key on the circle of fifths to a key that's one cycle clockwise or counterclockwise away from it, you're going to have four chords in common between the two key areas. If you go two cycles along the circle of fifths, either clockwise or counterclockwise, you'll have you'll have two chords in common between the two keys. If you go three cycles along the circle of fifths, you'll have zero chords or no chords in common between the two key areas. So an important aspect of this is that you have to make sure that in common chord modulation that the chords that you're going to, uh, sorry, the common chord, um, if you want to employ common chord modulation, you have to use closely related keys. So by closely related keys, I mean if I'm in C major, I can modulate to G major. There are four chords in common between these two key areas. Um, in G major, I could go to D major. There are four chords in common between those two key areas, which are demonstrated right here. Uh, four chords in common. Whereas if I'm going from G major to F major, that's two cycles along the circle of fifths, that's actually going to result in only two chords in common. Now if I went from G major to B flat major, that's three cycles along the circle of fifths, that's going to be resulting in no chords in common. So you can't use common chord modulation. But what do you do if you want to go from one of these chords to one of these key areas to another key area? We didn't talk about that. We only talked about common chord modulation last time. Um, but I guess really quickly, sorry, let me move my zoom window. Really quickly, it might be good to just describe a scenario where this happens. So let's say we're going to go from F major. Well, I guess someone, someone pick a key. Ah, I already did it. Uh, F major. Key of F major modulating to key of, let's see, E flat major. Okay. So let's say for whatever reason you want to modulate from, wait, that's not going to work. These, the reason that's not going to work is, well, that is going to work. That's absolutely going to work. The reason that's going to work is because it's actually within two cycles away from the original starting key. So that's going to work. Okay. So let's say you want to modulate to this key. It's kind of closely related. It's nearby. Uh, what chords could we actually use to modulate from the key of F major to the key of A flat major? Sorry, to the key of E flat major. Well, we could draw a quick chart to see the possibilities. Um, let's see. So <clears throat> let's do F major first. This is a good little refresher. Ignore all the stuff down here. These are wrong at the moment. Right? Just refactoring this. F, E flat major. This might happen in one of your compositions. You might like want to be in this key area and for some reason you just have this urge to go to this other key and you're like how am I going to get to this new key in a seamless way right you might be playing you might be just noodling on the piano this happens to me all the time and I'm just like man I'm in this new key area I don't know how I got here I like it here I was in this old key area before what do I do to make this a seamless transition well 
provided that the two carriers are closely related, you can use common chord modulation. So what are the primary triads of F major? What is the one chord in F major? F. Great. What is the two chord in F major? G minor. Right. All I'm going to have to do is change the, qual the, the roots, right? Because the qualities will stay the same. So what is the three chord? A. A minor. Four chord? B. B flat. Flat. B flat major, yes. And the five chord? C. E. C, very good. And then the six chord? D. D as in uh, dastardly. Uh, and then the seven five. chord is? E. Exactly. Okay. So let's do the same thing for E flat major. So the one chord, actually, we're going to have to change the qualities because this was minor, but you can reference the qualities right here. So the one chord is obviously going to be E flat major, right? The two chord is going to be, we'll just ignore these qualities for now. Well, no, we'll, we'll ignore these Roman numerals because they're wrong. What is the two chord in the key of E flat major? F minor. Uh, F minor, good. How about the three chord? G minor. G minor. G minor, absolutely. Okay. How about the four chord? A flat major. Yes, A flat major. And the five chord. B flat major. B flat major. Six chord. C minor. C minor. And the seven chord. Okay, let's all do this together, okay? I'm going to count to four. And on the next downbeat, one, I, I want you to basically say the chord, okay? One, two, three. Four. Okay, very good. That was very synchronized. Awesome. Okay. So we have D diminished. We need to throw on a metronome here or something so that we can all like sync up. In fact, I might actually do that. As a result of this, let's see if I can actually ask this. Let me let me see if this actually broadcasts. I think it should, actually. Incidentally, if you just type in metronome on Google. Metronome will come up. Is this playing? Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'm going to do this. Just to recap, all right? I'm going to go down to the 70s. 70. 70. Okay, every two beats, I want you to say a note of the E flat major scale. So we're going to start now. E flat. Sorry, actually, this is weird because my synchronization is different from this. Okay, this is what we're going to do. I have a better idea. I'm going to go into trusty Ableton. I was actually going to use this today just to show you a little bit about drum beats. Incidentally, if you guys are interested in learning about Ableton, second session of summer session, I'm teaching an Ableton class at UCSD. So it's a fun software. But I guess I'm going to use it for educational, notational educational purposes today. Um... Ooh, there's too many drums on this particular kit. Okay. So what we're going to do is this. I'm just going to create my own little rock band metronome. Can you guys hear that? Can you guys hear it's a me? Little, it's a little low, but yeah. It's a little low? Okay, cool. All right. Um, so um, let's get, there's nothing like uh, getting into this. So what we're going to do is this. Um, I guess I'm going to put in a utility device just to make it a little louder. I'm going to move your faces on Zoom. Gosh, I need a second monitor. Raise the gain a little bit. All right. Oh, wait, wait, that, sorry. That, the preview, it was previewing, so it's super loud. Sorry. 
All right. Okay, that's super fast. Super slow. The Goldilocks problem. All right, here we go. Can you guys hear that okay? A little bit, little better. Yeah, it's still, still a bit low. Still a bit low, huh? How about now? Yeah. yeah it's you guys, ready to rock out now? All right. Hope so. All right. Let's see. Let's see what's in the chat. <laughs> All right. Just reading the chats. Yeah. Thought a student took over the lecture. Hilarious. Okay. Yep. New look, new rock sound. Here we go. All right, so what's going on here? Um, technically, I am a student. So where was I on? Okay, this is what we're going to do. So you hear the little uh, crash sound or the, the, the open hi-hat sound on beat one. So I want you to do this. I want you to say the notes of the E-flat major scale on every single crash sound, starting at the next one. Go. E flat. F. G. G minor. A flat major. B flat major. C minor. D diminished. E flat major. All right, yeah. Now we're really rocking out now, aren't we, guys? All right. I can feel it. Audience is going wild. All right. Let's do the same thing, but for the key of... We'll do an easier one. Let's do A minor. Let's all the triads of A minor. For the next one starting now. A minor. A minor. B minor. C major. C major. D minor. E minor. E minor. F major. G major. G major. Or G diminished. A. A. Wait, it's G sharp. Yeah, we're rocking out now. Okay, um, the, thing, the thing about what I was... I forgot to tell you is that you could have done harmonic minor or natural minor. Um, combination of those two. All right, let's try, um, hmm, let's try, let's try it on this drum kit. Make it a little more hip hoppy. Okay. It's a little softer probably now. Okay. Hopefully you guys can hear it okay. Let's try uh, G minor, starting next one G minor Oh, you guys can't hear it very well? That's interesting. Why is it so loud on my Oh, you know what? Oh. Oh, I think I know why you can't hear it. Okay, brace your ears for a sec. Now you can hear it, huh? Is it better? You can hear it better now? Yeah. Okay, awesome. All right. Starting on the next one, I want you to tell me the triads of um, the F minor scale and now. F minor. G minor. A flat major. B flat major. C minor, C minor, D diminished. Let's slow it down a little bit, guys. Let's get to a slow jam, shall we? By the way, 60 beats per minute. What's unique about this? 60 beats per minute. Your heart rate? Well, it could be. It's, a, it's just one beat per second. Or? One one beat per second. So if you ever like don't have a metronome around you, 
you can just look at a clock with a second hand and you could use that. So this is basically moving exactly one second. Seconds just go by quickly, don't they? All right. So <clears throat> let's try, um, let's do the triads of F minor. No, I just did that. Ooh. Let's do the triads of G major. Next one, go. G major, 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 Major. Awesome. Okay. I'm going to take a slight detour here, and I'm going to show you something kind of cool, I think. I think I was kind of showing you this last time, but I didn't get around to it because it was the end of class. <clears throat> it's this idea. I guess we could actually, oh, you know what we could do? This is what we could do. Um, so, you know, if you're ever working in, like, the modality of something like Ableton, you might have noticed just now that... I was actually inputting rhythm durations and beat positions in a grid rather than via notation. Now, these two paradigms are very much equivalent in many regards. Um, you know, this axis kind of displays like the height of the pitch, basically. You know, like you're getting higher, your pitches are getting higher. The grids are getting higher. They kind of have a direct correspondence, right? This kind of axis kind of shows you time. So it's very much related. Why musicians that just didn't use grids to begin with? Well, I think all the extra, well, I guess we do because we have stabs, right? We have, um, we do have stabs. We, we basically have uh, the grid lines going this way. We just don't have the grid lines going this way but we have another separate system in notation, in regular traditional music notation, to notate um, duration. So we don't need these extra vertical lines of grids. And I think it actually kind of, in some ways, can be a little disorienting with all of these extra patterns. So I think people knew what a grid was when they dis invented music notation, however many hundreds years of years ago, bordering thousands of years ago. Um, or maybe bordering a thousand years ago, give or take a couple hundred years. <clears throat> but um, suffice to say, a computer will generally interpret uh, rhythmic data or musical pitch data in, in this fashion, which is very similar to this particular fashion, right? So yeah, it's probably, I know you've said this before, it was probably just because it would have taken too much ink. Oh, no, I haven't said that before. That's true, though. Yeah, that would have taken too much ink, and I could see that getting messy, probably, potentially. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Um, back in the days when you had feather-tipped uh, pens or whatnot, uh, you, couldn't, you didn't have an eraser. It might have also gotten very, not only um, ink-intensive, but you can't really take back errors. Um, yeah, it's adding another dimension of, um, also it's adding another dimension of preciseness that's probably difficult to achieve. It's probably, it was probably hard enough just to draw five staff lines. Um, although I will say, just because we're, I, I'll, I sh I'll show you a score from this composer that I think you'll find interesting. If you have already known this, this composer, but this, this composer, George Crumb, if you think, um, writing music is tedious by hand, which I certainly do. Check this out. This gentleman actually, what's crazy is that he actually wrote all of this stuff out by hand using rulers and straight hand, like just, can you imagine? Like even this text he like wrote out by hand. Um, let me look up some larger form scores maybe. Advanced images, advanced image search. Size, let's try large. Okay, so for instance, 
take a look at this one. Isn't that wild? So I guess some people have the patience to do this. I certainly don't. I just use the computer. Um, but I can imagine there was some, yeah, you want to minimize certain aspects of, you want to minimize the amount of ink you can put down. You want to minimize the precision errors. Um, also, when you, here's another problem with having everything to a grid. I just thought of this. Let's say you want to go from an eighth note. Let's say you want to put one eighth note in here, and then all of a sudden you want to put like four sixteenth notes in here. Um, well, I guess you could use a grid to do that and then just forego the notation. I guess the grid doesn't say that's wrong, but note heads would, it would take more, be more difficult to fit note heads in there um, without expanding the size of each cell of the grid. But that just makes you wonder why they, well, makes, it makes you wonder what if they just chose the grid instead. But we, long story short, we have two different systems of expressing notation. This is called like the MIDI piano roll. Uh, MIDI is a common interface for um, computer music software. For both computer music software and to allow you to connect um, your like piano keyboards to your computer. So for instance, if you have a little piano keyboard, like I do, which is underneath my desk at the moment, notice how every time I press a key, it's a little hard to see, there's a little yellow light that goes off right here. That's representing the MIDI data. So for instance, if I want to record myself, I could do something like this. Oh, wait a second. Oh yeah. That, if I were recording this live, I'm just playing my piano keyboard, for instance. It's not going to think of anything cool. Maybe it will. Who knows? Right? Right? It's just coming in like this. It's coming in in this notation. Right? That's MIDI notation. Um, what was that? Um, but I guess if you are wondering about um, traditional drum notation, there is this little handy mnemonic, or not mnemonic, well, whatever you would call it, that kind of overlays a drum kit over the stav. And these are the symbols that you would see to represent the different parts of a drum. So, for instance, for instance, this right here, I'm trying to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to overlay these two so you can see both, you can both see this and hear it. So I can be like, oh, this is this sound and this is this sound. All right. Let me try really quickly. Let me do it. There we go. Okay. Okay. So right here, this symbol right here. Oh. Okay. Sorry. It's a little small. Okay. This symbol right here is the hi hat. Um, I think this is this is basically telling you that uh, someone who someone who actually plays drums can tell me this, but if I'm correct or not. But I'm pretty sure what this sound is is something like this, right? I think actually no. Let me let me clarify. There's two different types of hi hats. The hi hat could be open. It sounds like this. Whoops, sorry. They play both of them. It could sound like that, where it's open. The hi hat can be closed, and it sounds like that. It sounds like this. Basically, there's two symbols that are kind of like you can imagine a symbol person going, right? And what you do is you basically press this little lever with your foot, and it basically shuts the hi hat. And if you shut the hi hat, you get this sound right here, which is very common in hip hop, right? can't really hear it, but it's basically, you can imagine this sound over and over and over and over and over again, right? Versus the open eye that sound, right? So that's what these two things communicate. The precise one that, which one communicates, either, I'm not exactly sure, one of them's open, one of them's closed. 
This right here is the bass drum sound or the kick drum sound. Uh, this is like, you know, a very, very common element to most music. It's, it, it accommodates the low frequency that you're kind of looking for. Right? Four on the floor kind of sound, right? This right here is a, is a very important aspect of the drum kit. This is the snare drum. Right? It could sound like this too. It could sound like this. It could sound like many things. Right? So I guess this is the kick drum. This is the snare drum. So one common thing you could do is you can alternate the kick drum and the snare drum. Right? That sounds good, right? More or less. And then another thing you can do is, you remember these little hi-hats I was telling you about? You could take the hi-hats. Let's do the closed hi-hats. And we can just basically, whoops. I could just put a bunch of them as eighth notes. Right? Yeah, pretty simple, right? You could get really trappy if you want. You could like, you could just say, oh, what if I take the hi-hats and like I divide them by two? We're divided by two. You get trap music, right? To some degree. You could also pitch these different hi-hats up and down. So the first hi-hat is a certain pitch. The second hi-hat's a different pitch. All kinds of things, all kinds of ideas that you can employ. But this is a very common pattern. And I'm only using, I guess, what am I, what am I using? What is this right here? the bass drum bass drum or the kick drum what is this thing the hat yep the hat or the hi-hat and what is this thing snare. the snare drum okay now these are like honestly the most common elements of the drum kit um, I'd say like you generally want to use all of these elements I think people who have miniaturized skeletal drum kits they will just um just use these they'll have like a miniature kit and they'll just have these three elements to like a cocktail gig for instance they might bring some of these drums along these drums right here are called tom drums and what these are are basically this is the high tom this is the mid mid tom and this is the low tom and basically you can also call these two toms rack toms because they're kind of on a rack sometimes, like attached to the bass drum. But let's take a look at how this sounds. So this is a mid tom. This is a high tom. If anyone's named Tom in here, high tom. And this right here is a low tom. Hmm. This is a high mid. So let's... The mid and high sound kind of similar in this case. High mid, high tom. Well, you know, a common place this happens, people often use these for drum fills. So you might have this pattern right here. Okay, and then what, what you might end up doing is, on beat four, you might end up doing something like this. like that right so it's more of an ancillary sort of effect to kind of fill in space you know I could you know you could you could do something more creative than that you can do something that's faster for instance right it's it's becoming something it's not quite exactly what I'd want but it's just to show you the different parts of a drum kit so these are the these are the tom drums I believe, and if there is a percussionist in the room, please clarify some of these like these peculiarities for me. Um, I believe this is the ride symbol, and this is the crash symbol. Could be getting this backwards, but I guess I'll play both of them for you. Is this the ride symbol? I mean, does someone for sure know that this is the ride symbol? 
no percussion people in here, huh? Interesting. Um, no one who played drumline or anything. Okay, well, they sound very similar. So conceptually, I think they're, they function kind of similarly. They're both gigantic symbols, which they kind of look like, right? They also are in music notation are notated with like an X or like this sort of, sort of thing, right? So it's, it won't suffice to just put in a regular note head. You actually have to like put an X note head. So if you use music software, you actually have to find the setting to change the note head. Otherwise, it'll play some other weird, it'll play some other percussion sound that isn't mm -hmm. part of the rock drum kit. It'll play like a shaker sound or something like that. This, these, these are the symbols pertaining to the rock drum kit or the jazz drum kit. But if we get over here, I think um, this is a crash and this is a ride. Okay. okay. So, you know, you could, you, there's some interchangeability between hi hats and rides, right? So I could do something like this. Sorry, it's obnoxious, I know. So I'm muting all of these hats, and I'm just going to play it as rides. So this is me. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to turn off preview, so you don't hear me mess with this. This is the same thing, but with hi hats. So this closed hi hat, and or you know you could you could have a open hi hat instead. You know, this might, it's, it's more intense. It might lead to a, a tom drum fill or something. You might go for, you might do something like this. Right? And you might go into a tom drum fill to finish it off, right? Um, but, you know, the crash symbol. So I, think, I believe this is the ride. I think right for ride. You know, jazz synth players also use this to go right? It kind of keeps time. Whereas the crash symbol, which is this symbol, represented by this symbol, is basically, um, it has more of a bombastic function. So it sort of like accentuates certain beats. Right? Um, I know this is just a little bit of backstory on this, but I figure it might be cool for you to know because I, I bet you some of you will probably use production music software like this and you'll want to incorporate some sort of rhythmic beat um, and you'll want to pro possibly translate your knowledge of notation into this format. And just, I guess my main point is that it's very similar, right? Time axis, pitch axis, right? What you see over here is a little piano roll. I think my mom's got a smoothie. Thank you so much. All right, awesome. Uh, all right. Um, hmm, the clanging of cups just kind of sounded like a hi-hat. So it's, there's all kinds of percussion in the real world, which kind of sounds like, like percussion from a rock kit. So anyway, I, and I bet you a lot of you would, would probably dive into music production if you had the software, had the time. So just a little bit of backstory. And of course, stop me if you have any questions. Just interrupt me. Um, and so I guess this, rub, this, uh, this drum machine pattern book is kind of cool because it shows you 260 drum machine patterns. And it shows you them according to genre. So for instance, like, let's say like, you really enjoy playing disco music. Well, if you enjoy playing disco music, you can go to page 22. Are the page numbers truncated? I can't, there are no page numbers. Huh. Oh, there, okay, got lucky. So this is basically disco right here. But in fact, I guess I can actually try to play this. Well, I guess this right here, based on our previous symbol knowledge, well, I guess it's telling us. I think this is, there are more symbols that we don't know about, but this is, what you see here is a bass drum, a snare drum, right? Bass drum, bass with snare, bass, bass with snare. And then I think this is, well, let's refer to the other chart because I'm not exactly sure. 
Closed hat and open hat. Probably. Oh yeah, yeah, there we go. Closed hat and open hat, awesome. Let's just find, it. I'm just gonna randomly find out my software. This is the closed hat. Kinda sounds a little disco, right? Yeah. The kit is not the quite the correct kit that I like it's not the right sound that you probably want for disco, but it sounds sort of disco-ish. This is a little variation on it. Right? Kind of interesting, right? Then let's see. I'm just doing my best to finger drum here. So I apologize for the mistakes. Let's see. Awesome. I'm going to practice this stuff. This is really cool. This is awesome, actually. This is really fun. Invigorating. Um, so I would uh, just pay attention to the fact that these are all variations on this first pattern right here. So there are all kinds of resources out here. I just, I just recently found this, and now I've, I'm exploring this with you guys, and I just I'm really think this is really cool. This is a great way to practice different patterns. Or if you're actually a real drummer, you could you could apply this to your your drum kit. Or if you're a you know if you're a singer, you could just apply some of these rhythms to your um, articulation. Like you could you could you could create lyrics that are centered around the hi hat pattern, for instance, or the bass drum pattern, for instance. So there's there's a billion things to be said about this, but it's um, it's very fun in my opinion. There's not really a place. A specific place for this in the music one curriculum, but I figure I might as well explain this to you because it's just cool and uh, practical. So let's, without further ado, <laughs> this is going to be a disaster, but let's try this. Uh, <laughs> oh man, this is going to be so disastrous. I don't think this is going to work. I was going to say one third of the class do the bass drum part, one third of the class do the snare drum part, one third of the class do the hi hat part. <laughs> think that's going to work. Um, okay. Yeah, unfortunately, that's not going to work. Just imagine it, though, in your head. Um, okay. Any questions about this or comments? Yeah. Is this going to be available on the OneNote? I'll put this on the OneNote. Um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this on the... Or maybe I already did put it there. Let me see. Oh, yeah. 260 rhythm, rhythm patterns. It's on the one note. Um, yeah, awesome. I'll, I'm so psyched that you guys um, are looking into this because it's really fun. And again, if you're interested in learning more about how to incorporate this into a production environment, Ableton over the summer, second session, um, or there's a ton of tutorials online, regardless of what software you use. And if you ever need help installing just send me an email and I'll do my best. It's a little easier on Mac, but there are versions of Windows. They're just not as up to date that are easier to install. So if you're one of those people, just nudge me and we'll, we'll figure it out. Okay. So let's get back to modulation and some of the other aspects that you aren't going to quite be quizzed on, but it's good to know. So we kind of stopped. We took a little detour, right? We were like, oh, well, if we're more than three cycles away on the circle of fifths, or more than two cycles away on the circle of fifths, we're not going to have any chords in common. Therefore, we can't do a common chord modulation. But there are situations when you would want to go from like G major to B flat major. What do you do in that situation? Well, I guess the first thing I'll tell you is this. There is this idea, instead of common chord... I mean, never mind. What were we gonna say? Sorry, it's, some of, some of you guys are a little hard for me to understand here because I think the internet connection's bad. So I, I like, I think, Pehan may have been saying something, but you were breaking in and out. Well, no, I just forgot to mute. So I'm sorry. Oh, okay, no worries. Um, let's see. So one thing that you could do, even though G major and B flat major don't have any chords in common, what you could do is actually reference the idea, there's this idea called common, I guess I'll switch, jump here, common tone modulation. So we talked about the pivotal moment, right? The pivotal moment 
being this idea where there's one chord that's in common with both key areas, but you could actually have a chord that's partially shared between both key areas. Um, there's still a pivotal moment because there's a chord, there's part of the chord that's shared, but um, if the entire chord is shared during, uh, if, if all of the notes during the pivotal moment are common, I guess let me clarify this. If all of the notes of the chord during the pivotal moment are common to both key areas, we call it common chord modulation. If only one or two of the notes of the chord during the pivotal moment are common to both key areas, we call it a common tone modulation. So for instance, let me see if I can play this. Sorry, I'm in a really weird ergonomic spot in my desk looking, hunching over this microphone and talking and everything. And also my keyboard receipts under my desk got all this stuff. So not make, try not to make excuses when I make mistakes, but probably gonna make some mistakes. Ooh, that's not the right sound at all. That's how, that's how that piece would sound on drum, with drum kit notation, in case anyone was wondering. Can you guys hear that? I guess you can, right? Ooh, you can hear it uh, double. We want to rock. I can't, I, can't, I can't fault the program for wanting to rock, you know? Definitely going to mess up this chord. I apologize. Okay. So what we have basically over here is this really, first of all, really amazingly juicy, awesome chord, which I want to like practice and get better at. It's really cool. It's amazing. Basically, it's like a diminished chord in the right hand. It's a C minor chord in the left hand over a G pedal. But I guess the overall sound of it, to me at least, sounds like a diminished chord. Um, and then basically it goes to G major right and then here's the thing we had this note G which is the bridge between going from the G major tonality to the E flat major tonality right because actually G exists in the key of E flat major choose a diff different color Insert, draw, insert, whoops, blah, blah, blah. Um, it sort of eases you in. It's part of the pivotal moment. It doesn't, so this is the idea. It's in common chord modulation, you share the entire chord. All the notes of the chord are shared um, as a transitionary pivotal portion between the two carriers. Whereas in common tone modulation, you can get by with just sharing one of the notes, right? What's another song that does this? I think, I think you know what song does this? You guys know that Nirvana song, The Man Who Ruled, Ruled the World? Right? There's the G that kind of, the G fits into all three key areas. It's kind of, that's interesting, actually. Um, it starts out in G major. And then it goes to E flat major. And then it goes to C minor. And the G actually fits into all keys, right? So you can kind of modulate to nearby keys without sharing all of the notes of a chord, but just one of the notes to kind of ease you into the new key area. So that's what common tone modulation refers to. Um, direct modulation. Okay, so take a swig of this really quick.
So I had to drink the whole thing. It's delicious. Um, okay. So we kind of talked about how the key of G major and E flat major don't share any chords in common. Um, so the only way, I guess it's not the only way. One way to get to the new key is via direct modulation. In direct modulation, you immediately go to the new key without any preparation from the original key. So in order to make this effect less jarring, you may use dominant motion to get you to the new key area. Um, or you might use a secondary dominant or a leading tone chord in the original key. Um, I believe this last part, maybe this last part has a caveat. This might be a separate thing altogether, but let me just talk about the vanilla version of direct modulation. It's basically... It's not cool. Yeah. On that last slide, um, should the other... It says E flat major, but then the one is an F minor. Oh, oh, oh this one right here? Or uh, the one is in G minor? Well, no, on the right, it says the one is an F minor. Oh, yes. Thanks for catching that. So I guess this would be... Oh, how do I fix this? Oh, I got to fix a lot of stuff here. So I guess I got to do... But is the E flat major just supposed to be F minor? I think the E flat major is, you know, I think the E flat, I think I put the correct numbers here. I just forgot, I put the wrong Roman numerals. I think. So I think if I change this to two, for instance, I think that should fix it. Or, oh, this should be capital. Five. Thanks for catching that, by the way. These are the things that will... I'm trying to actually still finagle my way into teaching Music 2 next year, but there's a very high chance that I'll teach Music 1 next year. But if either way, it's good to have my story straight. Okay. I think I did that correctly. Hopefully. Cool. So direct modulation, really, it's just you're going from one key to another. So this is. Right. We're in A minor. Hey, look, we're in C major. Hey, look, we're in A minor. We're just kind of going to the new key area. We just don't care. We're like, okay, I'm going to go to the new key area. So what? Now, this is also called phrase modulation in this context because you're sort of, sometimes direct modulation is called a variety of things. And I think I wrote the different things they're called here. Sometimes called phrase modulation, static modulation, abrupt modulation. Um, now, you could make a case that it's not quite, you know, it's, it, Again, with a lot of these music theory concepts, especially things that are more higher order, there are blurred lines between these different uh, concepts. So for instance, you could make the case that this is some sort of common tone modulation, right? Because you have the E from the E minor, which precedes or presages the E in the C major tonality, right? So in some ways, this is direct modulation. Um, chromatic modulation, you could kind of, or common tone modulation, could be a subset in some way of direct modulation. If you want to make things really black and white, and, and I think I described it in that way, in the most black and white ways that you can describe modulation, you really completely, totally ease into the new key area by having a common chord. Or you can somewhat jump into the new key area, either completely or, or indirectly, or you can do something in between. And we've talked about um, some of these possibilities. Um, so, again, there's, depending on which theorist you ask, there's different um, perspectives on this, but I guess just understand th the line of thinking is the important thing. So, here, you're going from E minor to C major, right? You're going directly between these two key areas. You might make the case that this E is presaging this, making it a little less abrupt. But there's no common chord modulation, right? There's not like a chord that matches um, this tonality with this tonality, at least not, not the way that it's employed. Um, 
there are chords in common between E minor and C major because the relative minor of E minor, re, sorry, the relative major of E minor is G major. And so G major certainly has a lot of chords in common with C major, but Mozart elected not to use that chord to modulate. It just, he wanted a different sound. Okay, so that's direct modulation. It's one example, of course, for showing how they're kind of related. Okay, so chromatic modulation. And, and as I'm doing more research, I'm finding more and more duplicate definitions for some of these terms. So for instance, in this book, no, we're not gonna talk about enharmonic modulation. Um, So yeah, I just stumbled across this definition today. So what I was going to get to is, is this idea, chromatic modulation. So there's a lot of text here. I want to make this more, I, I have the example here, but I want to refresh this so it's not so much text, but it is what it is for now. Um, so secondary dominance and secondary diminished chords make use of something called a chromatic progression. Um, and the chromatic progression just basically means there are notes that are not in the original key when you're using the progression. So for instance, this is a chromatic, this is the Bruno Mars um, or sublime progression, right? Um, and what you see here is a note that doesn't fit into the key, so it's chromatic to the key. So this is a chromatic chord progression. It's a secondary dominant, it's, it's compelling, right? It's not a diatonic, uh, non-chromatic progression. It's a chromatic progression. So there is something that could happen with these chromatic progressions. They could return to the original key, right? You could do, you can, you can come back to the original key, right? In this particular case, you're just in the sixth chord right here, but maybe later on in the song, in Sublime's case for... It comes back to the one chord, right? Right, it comes back to the chord. Right, it comes back. It, it, it only references the sixth chord temporarily, right? It comes back to the one chord again, right? But these chromatic progressions are dangerous. Well, not dangerous. Um, they just can lead to modulation. You might actually find this dominant motion so compelling, this falling fifth motion so compelling that you're like, nah, I'm just gonna stay there. I like that, right? I like that key area that I went to temporarily and it's gonna become my new home. So. Add an extra chord in there, the one chord, but what happens here, right? This is just what this chord is right here in F major is a five of six. And then we go to six in the, in the old key. Normally, I will say that normally these are above, so I'll do that. The old key is usually above and the new key is usually below. Um, but what, what's happening here is and I guess this G minor in the old key, it's not really a standard two chord. Oh, I, no, it is, it is, it is. It's just, a, it's a two chord. So six, two, this A major chord in the key of, old, the original key of F major is going to be, it's not really there, right? It's like, it's a three, we're definitely not in F major anymore, right? Because you could also consider this as a secondary dominant. You can consider this as like a five of six, which would ultimately go to a six again, right? But then you're like, well, it's, it keeps going to the six. Why am I describing this as in this way? Why am I describing this piece 
as like secondary dominance when really this piece has moved on to a different Kyria, right? I might as well just say, well, this chord really, right here, really just brought us to a new key. And from this point forward, I'm just going to analyze these chords in terms of the new key. Um, so this particular moment right here, I guess I found a different, this is, this is an example of chromatic modulation. Okay. And I guess a subset in particular, I guess you could call this a secondary common chord. Because it's actually, um, or actually, no, this might not be. The pivot chord is a secondary chord in both keys. No, it's not a secondary common chord. That's, that's beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about today. But um, conceptually, it's not that difficult to understand. Um, so anyway, this is an example of chromatic modulation. And you just use the secondary dominant chord, secondary diminished chord even, which we've talked about many times, which we're so accustomed to just, well, we're very used to actually resolving it to the proper chord, right? The chord in the denominator. And the idea is that we just stay in the key area and instead of coming, returning back to the original key area, we stay in the new key area. And once again, if we stay in the original key, it's known as tonicization. If we go to the new key, whoa, it's known as chromatic modulation. Okay. Okay. Okay, here's another idea, sequential modulation. So a harmonic sequence might take you to a new key. So just kind of um, expounding on what a harmonic sequence is. You know what a sequence is in terms of like, it's this idea that we've talked about in the context of melody, um, where we basically have a particular melodic idea and we just move it to a different note of the scale. So the application, um, the idea behind harmonic sequences is that you basically move, I guess I should explain this a little thoroughly, you're basically moving the harmony by a specific interval and you keep moving the harmony by a specific interval. So, and you keep using chords that are within the key for the most part. So for instance, right here, we're in D minor and then we're, we're, we're shifting down a fifth. We're shifting to a chord whose root is a fifth below it. And we're, we're sticking to the chord that's in the key. So let's say, um, this is hard to know. Let's say we're in the key of C major, okay? Um, give me one moment. I'm gonna I'm gonna pull up something that I think will make might make this a little bit easier to understand. Okay. So let's say we're starting on the two chord, right? If I go if I go down a fifth, if I if I select a chord that's a fifth whose root is a fifth below this root note, what chord will I land on? One. Two, three, four, five. All right? So I'll land on a five dominant seven, right? Now, if I sequence this again by a fifth, what chord will I land on? One, two, three, four, five. I'm going to land on this chord, right? All right, great. Now if I sequence this one more time, what chord am I gonna land on? Remember, this is just an octave above, so I'm gonna start here. One, two, three, four, five. I land on the four chord, right? If I, see, if I, if I continue to sequence this progression by fifths, what will I land on next? One, two, three, four, five. I'm going to land on the seven half diminished chord, right? What if I sequence this one more time? 
Okay, as I move my mouse cursor, I want you to tell me the answer. One, two, three, four. Minor seven. Three minor seven, right? Yes. Okay, so you can basically, does, does that make sense, everyone? This is also like a really useful thing that um, you're not necessarily expected to know for the one series, but it's so cool that um, you might as well know. You're going to definitely cover sequences more in the 2 series and the 101 series. But that's what that was. I basically, I chose chords that were all in the key, right? Because it's not transposition. If I'm transposing down by fifth, I'm basically retaining the quality. I'm retaining the exact quality. So if I'm transposing by fifth, I'm going to get this lo-fi hip-hop thing. It's in a muddy register at that point, but... The difference between transposition and sequencing is that when I transpose, I actually maintain all of the original intervals of the chord. Whereas if I sequence, I'm using... I'm just basically sequencing... Uh, I'm just basically sequencing the root note down a fifth, in this case, and I'm just letting the chord, I'm just building a seventh chord that exists in the key. And then I'm using the chord that exists in the key at that time. So this is a harmonic sequence, a des descending fifth harmonic sequence. Um, the application to this is that if, you, if you're doing this, you can actually use this to propel yourself into a new key area, right? It's kind of like a train that just never ends, right? Right? I'm just like, I'm just going to stop at E major, please, and I'm just going to enjoy E major, right? Okay, how about this? I'm going to play the sequence. I want someone to say stop. And then when you stop, I'll just cadence in that key. I think you said stop one before, but um, if I stopped at the B diminished, ooh, that would be that would be strange. Um, that was a good. I think you did say stop right there, <laughs> and if I did stop there. It's, it's, it's hard. It, it, this particular chord doesn't establish a key area very well. So you, this is one of the places you probably wouldn't stop. So it's a good educational example. Just like um, we talked about with secondary dominance and, and the sort, um, that there are certain chords that... There are certain key areas that you want to tonicize. Or I guess in this case, you can extend this to be like, there are certain key areas that you could modulate to by just saying, I'm just going to stop here and I'm going to exist in this key. Whereas if I stopped right here, it doesn't really establish the key very well that we're in. So, so this is a way that you can get to a different key just by sequential means. So here is an example of this. Beethoven. Ooh, oh, that was totally wrong. Let's see. This is the Waldstein. So basically, and then it's basically sequencing this. This this is not a direct fifth sequence. This is uh, quite. This is a little bit different. Um, but you're basically moving this uh, particular idea. In some ways, this is blurring the line between sequence and transposition, to be honest. Because you're basically... And then you're doing this. If you kept doing this... Right? You can kind of see how that feels like a sequence, right? One of my favorite things to do on piano is to make up sequences. It's so satisfying. Because you can just basically practice your idea 
and then you can practice doing it in all the different keys. It's a very kind of satisfying thing to find this pattern that you can just basically move to different keys and you can just do it forever. Right? It's just fun to do. So sequencing is very useful um, compositionally, but it's also useful for a practice um, point standpoint because if you're an instrumentalist, as you probably are aware by now, there are 12 major keys. If you sequence things in a certain, ver in a certain way, you can actually practice your ideas in all of these different keys. So that, you know, if I did something like... So if I'm in a jazz setting and I have to like use that lick, I'll feel confident that I'll be able to do it correctly because I've practiced it in every single possible key area. So it's a useful thing to do. It's just fun. In fact, um, Mark Levine in his jazz piano book says that one of his favorite things to do is just, I mean, one of the things that gets most, the, the best audience reaction is just by sequencing something. He'll just like sequence something really mundane and he'll be like, they'll be like, what was that? And he's just like, I was just sequencing something. And I was just playing the same idea in all these different keys. But there's a wow factor when you hear this. It just sounds nice. It's, it's like there's a feeling like, ah, oh, I'm like, I'm moving to a different key area. It's like so heart wrenching. It just feels good. So I guess you can sequence through modulation is, I mean, you can modulate through sequence. Let's take a look at this one. Let's see. Oh, I should practice this. Oh, okay. This is in three. So, one. Two. Right? So, we start out in C major. And then after that, we basically... You can keep sequencing it. Oh, right. To practice it. So this is actually very similar to what we do during warm-ups. You know, when we, when we, back in the good old days when you used to sing together, remember those days? Um, right? Basically, sequencing slash transposing, there's, there's some similarities there. I haven't quite gotten to the bottom of it, but they, the, 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 just the, the basic principle behind both of them is that you're basically moving the intervals of the original idea to a different key area. Let's take a look at Haydn. This one's been Haydn from us. Let's see. Okay. So this is this is totally sequencing. For infinity and beyond. Okay. So that's a little bit of sequencing. Now, any questions by the way? Sorry, I'm, I feel like I'm talking a lot today. Not that I don't always talk a lot, but I feel like I'm talking and some people aren't there's not as much engagement, or unless everyone's just totally transfixed by what I'm saying, which is, which is what I'm hoping. Um, the music is, is amazing, so the musical possibilities are amazing. Um, so yeah, please, if you ever, I, I'm never offended if, if anyone just interrupts me, just be like, excuse me, I have a question. You could just say that, and I won't be offended. Okay, parallel key modulation. It induces a change of mode 
but it keeps the same key center. So for instance, you might go from A major to A minor. And actually, um, Connor was around last time after class for a little bit, and I remember there's a piece that does this very well. Oh, wrong key. But is this the right key? Oh, I think it's this key. We're in C minor. We're still in C minor. And then we're in C major. Right, we're in C, we go from C minor. So that sounds nice, right? Uh, we're inducing a change of mode. Hmm, mode. That's an interesting word. I wonder if we're going to talk about that next class. And I think we are. So this might be a good place to stop because I actually didn't put anything for anharmonic modulation because I think that's beyond the scope of this class anyway. So anyway, I guess that's time. So I'll pause the share. I'll pause the recording.